I'm very grateful to be part of this summit track. It's looking at models from our heritage in the Stone Campbell movement and the Churches of Christ that might help us navigate growing tensions and conflicts in our churches today. Wes asked me to focus on a person for whom I have great admiration who lived through the first major division in the Stone Campbell movement, T.B. Larimore. I'd like to look briefly first at how he came to be a Christian, then examine how he dealt with the extreme discord over the issues of the late 1800s and early 1900s to see what in his life might help guide our words and actions now. We'll especially look at two events in which he shows how he maintained his commitment to unity and peace when he was under tremendous pressure to denounce other followers of Christ over matters that, frankly, were far from the heart of the gospel. Larimore was born in to poverty, I guess you'd say, in East Tennessee in July 1843. He had little exposure to religion growing up and not much formal education, but he did become an avid reader. By the time he was 17, he was admitted to a Baptist school known today as Carson Newman University in East Tennessee. He learned Calvinist doctrine about salvation, but never had the kind of experience, conversion experience, his teachers taught him to expect. In the meantime, his mother and sisters had responded to the preaching of two disciples, preachers, and were baptized. Larimore was not convinced of the legitimacy of their baptism since they had not had the kind of religious experience that he was taught they should have. Captured while serving as a scout for the Confederacy in 1863, he took the non-combatant oath and was sent home, only to have his house burned by local vigilantes. His family moved to Hopkinsville, Kentucky, where leaders in the Christian church, where his mother and sisters became members, mentored and taught him. He was immersed in July 1864 and began to give short lessons at church. When the congregation asked him to preach regularly, he knew he needed more education, and so he moved to Franklin College near Nashville, led by Talbert Fanning, for a year and then began itinerant preaching and teaching in rural Mississippi, Alabama, and Tennessee. In 1868, he married Julia Gresham, and when the couple inherited land near Florence, Alabama from her father in 1870, he decided to open a school. He named it Mars Hill Academy. Over the next years, he gained a reputation as a skilled evangelist and preacher, and a kind and diligent teacher. He would eventually become one of the most widely known and beloved leaders in the Stone Campbell movement. But he was living in a time of growing alienation and division. Controversies began to heat up in the 1870s over issues like the legitimacy of extra congregational organizations like missionary societies, the use of instrumental music in worship, and the hiring of full time preachers. In 1875, Larimore announced the publication of a paper. He called it the angel of mercy, love, peace, and truth. In the midst of the inflammatory journalism of the day, Larimore attempted to publish a journal with only articles of a positive nature. He explained the journal's editorial policy in 1875. Quote, the angel possesses not the slightest belligerent proclivity, not even in the latent or dormant state. It will avoid all unpleasant discussion and personal references. One harsh, unkind, or unpleasant word will be sufficient reason for consigning to the flames any articles written for its pages. He gave two full pages of each issue free to advertise all the other disciples' periodicals, whether conservative or progressive, with the endorsement, We heartily recommend them all. He even offered anyone who would take five of the papers listed a free subscription to his paper, The Angel. He got a few subscribers. Uh, while other papers focused on the inflammatory and exciting fights over the issues, Larimore's published mostly devotionals, the devotional articles on topics like heaven, obedience, evil communication. Many of the articles were written by women, including Mrs. Alexander Campbell. Fact is, reading nothing but Larimore's magazines, you would have had no idea there was any trouble whatsoever among the churches. He believed that his approach of ignoring the difficulties and concentrating on strengthening the movement with positive Bible teaching 
was the way to restore unity. Not many rallied behind his efforts at peacemaking, however, despite his growing popularity as an evangelist. Early in his career, Larimore gave two reasons why he did not attack fellow Christians who did not act exactly as he did or understand everything exactly as he did. First, he said that he could understand how people could act correctly and still not imitate him exactly. But perhaps even more important, he explained that he loved his fellow Christians and had resolved long ago never to go to war against them. It was only a pure, unadulterated, fervent Christian love that could save the movement from division. Arrogance that insisted on its way in matters like those being disputed was the source of the strife. Picture Christ suffering on the cross, he begged, and then think of your refusal to surrender your selfish desires. In a sermon that he preached titled Union and Unity, he quoted the familiar unity passage from John 17, verses 17 to 23, and then he asked how the Father, Jesus, and his disciples could be one. Now, frankly, some might question his Trinitarian theology. Larimore answered that Jesus and his disciples could be one only in the way that Jesus and Jehovah were one. Quote, one in aims, one in purpose, working harmoniously together for the same glorious results. It would be ludicrous to imagine the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit hating, slandering, misrepresenting, backbiting, and abusing one another. Same has to be true with Christians, he believed. Wrangling, disputing, and dividing had no more place among Christians than among the members of the Godhead. Laramore insisted that it was a privilege for Christians to be able to waive their own preferences or opinions in the interest of peace. The prevailing spirit was cursing the cause of Christ by pr prompting sincere people to refuse to recognize as Christians anyone except those who and these are the terms they use then, ride their hobby, believe the thing, same things they do in exactly the same way. Those matters about which the scriptures said nothing, which he believes included instrumental music and society, missionary societies, were in the realm of opinion. And being in the realm of opinion, he saw it as his duty never to preach about them. It was the matters of faith, of divine truth, and sacred principle about which the scriptures did speak, that he was compelled to preach. As the controversies in the Stone Campbell movement became increasingly heated, Larimore was constantly asked with which part of the movement he identified, or at least to which side he felt closest. He always responded that as far as he knew, he belonged to nothing except that to which every Christian belonged, the church. Quote, I've never belonged to a wing of the church or anything else. I belong to Christ. Hence, to the Church of Christ, not to a wing of the Church. The factions in the movement were identified by their stands on the various questions, and again, when he was asked to take a stand on them, he responded kind of tongue-in-cheek, I think, that the questions were not good things to stand on. If Christians thought they had to do something with the questions, it would be better to sit on them and to stand on Christ and Him crucified. Larimore believed that the tendency to divide that's so characteristic of human nature and could be seen then in the church could be restrained and transformed to unity only through the power of Christ. Only by being shaped by the Spirit of Christ could the struggle for unity be waged at all. Larimore acted out his conception of how unity could be achieved, though his struggle, frankly, was a losing one. Let's look now at two incidents in Larimore's life in which he acted out his convictions about how to be shaped by and follow Christ in the midst of massive challenges. The first happened in Sherman, Texas in the mid-1890s. Sherman Church had been started in 1850 and built its first meeting house in 1874 on Houston Street. In the summer of 1888, Larimore held a one-month revival for the Houston Street Church that resulted in 50 editions. In the early 1890s, Houston Street began experiencing controversy over the instrumental music issue. Those who favored it moved an instrument into the building in 1893, and each side threatened to withdraw 
from the congregation to split it if it did not get its way. Church leaders called Laramore to help reunite the congregation. Laramore had endeared himself to many members at Sherman during that month-long meeting in 1888, members who now found themselves lined up on one side or the other in the instrumental music fight. Everyone seemed to agree, however, that Laramore might be able to resolve the congregation's problem. Laramore agreed to come as a visiting preacher, not as the regular preacher, and would speak twice each day and three times on Sundays until he and the church believed he had done all the good he could. The meeting began on January the 3rd, 1894, and continued every day until June the 7th. He preached 330 sermons, and there were 254 additions to the Houston Street Church, as well as a number that became part of a small pro-missionary society group that had begun in 1882 called Central Christian Church. As long as Laramore was there, the instrument controversy was largely forgotten. All the members supported the meeting, and the organ, which was played during the first few weeks of services but was later just left out, was never publicly mentioned by Laramore. Shortly after Laramore left town, however, the congregation divided. Those who opposed instrumental music met at 11 a.m. each Sunday. Those who favored it held their services at 3 p.m. And that arrangement continued for several months until 1895 when the pro-organ group left and established what's called today First Christian Church. This incident would become a focus of attacks on Laramore, both from the pro- and anti-instrumental groups. The editor of the Dallas Christian Courier, which was published by the Progressive Disciples in Texas, insinuated that Laramore was responsible for the division because he would not condemn those who were causing trouble opposing using instruments in worship. On the other hand, writers of the Gospel Advocate accused Laramore of not being willing to preach against the, quote, sinful innovation. It was a no-win situation. His godly, loving personal presence had kept the antagonists at bay, but when he was no longer there physically, when he could no longer be there and talk personally and face-to-face, personal agendas and pride overcame the model that he had tried to give them. Laramore never responded to the attacks on him. He continued to preach wherever he was invited. The second event took place three years later in the summer of 1897. In July that year, an open letter to T.B. Laramore, written by a former student, then Alabama State Evangelist Oscar P. Spiegel, appeared in the Christian Standard. In the letter, Spiegel reminisced about happy days at Mars Hill a decade earlier, and then talked about the political and religious unrest in the United States generally, as well as as the unrest in the Stone-Campbell movement. Spiegel insisted that Laramore must not be silent while those of his religious family were drifting apart. He owed it to himself, his family, his friends, and to God to, quote, speak out on some matters now retarding the progress of the cause of Christ. Spiegel pressed Laramore for his position on whether a musical instrument was permissible in worship, if it were justifiable to organize groups other than local churches to promote mission work, whether or not consultation or cooperative meetings were antagonistic to the scriptures, and whether a regular paid ministry was in harmony with the scriptures and conducive to the best interests of the cause of Christ. Apparently, Laramore saw the letter for the first time when he got his copy of the Christian Standard when it was published. He immediately wrote a long response and sent it to the movement's major papers. He began his response this way. My dear brother, if you deem it possible for a person to be in no sense a partisan, but just simply and solely a Christian in this intensely partisan age, please try to believe that I am not a partisan, and that what I write, all I write, is written from no partisan point of view, but that I write simply and solely as a Christian with no selfish partisan or personal purpose to subserve. He then made the point that 
Spiegel's open letter was proof that he had never spoken out on any of the matters over which the movement was then fighting. He insisted, however, that the fact he had never spoken out on the issues did not mean that he had no opinions or preferences about them. He did. But he had simply let those subjects alone, and so he could not be counted in any sense in that fight. Was he to be blamed, he said, for being silent on subjects the wisest, greatest, and best Christians on all sides were constantly accusing each other of not being able to understand? Then he expressed his views in a way that surely offended people on both sides. When Brother Campbell, Mrs. Enos Campbell, the man in Hopkinsville, Kentucky, who baptized him, when Brother Campbell took my confession on my 21st birthday, he questioned me relative to none of these matters now retarding the progress of the cause of Christ. While thousands have stood before me hand in mind and made the good confession, I've never questioned one of them about these matters. Shall I now renounce and disfellowship all of these who do not understand these things exactly as I understand them? They may refuse to recognize or fellowship or affiliate with me, but I will never refuse to recognize or fellowship or affiliate with them. Never. The word never was in all caps in the original. The Christian Standard and others published the article. The Standard actually endorsed it. The Gospel Advocate printed it, but didn't have any reply in July. But in the 12th August issue of the Gospel Advocate, David Lipscomb responded that it was a serious misunderstanding of the teaching of Christ to think a person could see things introduced into the service which were not written in Scripture and be silent. God did not give Christians the privilege of standing on neither side in such matters. They were given only the privilege of standing on the right or wrong side. If Laramore did not stand for what was right, he stood for what was wrong. Alienated from many progressives by his refusal to endorse the controversial practices, and alienated from many conservatives by his refusal to denounce the progressives, Laramore was convinced that his stance was the only right one. He ended his letter to Spiegel's open letter, What I have written, I have written, and I am willing for the world to see it. I think it's safe to say that Laramore's personal positions on the divisive issues were on the conservative side. Fighting over the issues made Christians act in unchristlike and divisive ways, he said. These practices were not inherently contrary to Scripture, yet they had caused massively bitter feelings and division. While he continued to maintain fellowship with his brothers and sisters in Christ who went with the progressives, by the second decade of the 20th century, his main networks were part were in the conservative part of the movement. Laramore firmly believed that by standing only on Christ, that is, believing on Christ as the Son of God, obeying his clear commands, and being shaped by his spirit, a person could be a Christian only, and thereby united with all other Christians. This was not meant to be a barrier. It was meant to be an openness to be united with all other Christians. He sincerely believed that the best way to promote unity was to de-emphasize or ignore divisive issues, which were not biblical issues, to preach and teach only what he believed was obvious and clear from the scriptures, and to hold in complete Christian fellowship those on all sides of the issues. He attempted to follow this strategy, though severely criticized by persons from all sides of his fracturing fellowship. He was a living, though tragic, model of what he believed was the only way to unity. Now, having heard part of Laramore's story, we have to ask the question, can we draw anything from Laramore's example for ourselves today? Some might say yes. The lesson is you can't keep out of the fights. You have to take a stand. Some would definitely agree with that. Some might say that Laramore's stance was naive and ultimately a failure, so don't try it. I think it's important to note that his refusal to become embroiled in the fights did not mean that he retreated to a corner and became inactive. 
He had given himself for decades to pouring his life into the service of Christ and the church, and as a result had become so respected and loved that he was constantly covering the country, preaching, teaching, baptizing, aiding churches to refocus on what was most important, to heal congregational divisions. He was focused on the Spirit of Christ. Would it be possible, would it be something that would be right and good for any of us to take such a stance today within our Stone Campbell Movement churches, in Christianity generally, in our nation? I want to believe that it's possible. I know that he did it, though he suffered greatly for it, and in the minds of many people, didn't make that much difference. I also know that many of the sharp divisions and potential divisions in the church today have originated in the political life of this nation. Many of these issues, not like the ones that Larimore was dealing with primarily, but many of these issues hit at the heart of Christ and the gospel because they involve often the well-being of huge numbers of people. To ignore issues that have to do with the well-being of people that harm potentially God's children would distort the very nature of Christ and the church. In my opinion, these current issues, many of them, are not the moral equivalent to whether or not to use instruments in worship or conduct missionary or benevolent work through parachurch organizations. Maybe the key is that Larimore was silent on the divisive issues that were peripheral to the gospel, but he was not silent. He was constantly preaching Christ. He was constantly loving all people. He was constantly modeling the Spirit of Christ. I would hope that if Larimore were alive today, he would speak out in his loving, forceful way against the white supremacist ideology that is so much a part of white Christianity in America. But I don't know. Being confrontational seems to be against his nature. He tried in his own time and circumstances with the issues then in play to model the love of Christ. I believe there is a time when Christians must speak out and work against anti-Christian attitudes and actions that have settled in the hearts of Christians. I do sincerely believe, however, that drawing from Larimore's model, we must seek to reflect the image of Christ when we do engage the principalities and powers of this world. I pray that I and all of us can model Larimore's godly manner increasingly in our lives and work. Thank you for listening and considering these things.